All forms of escalation take things in the wrong direction and won't help Iran itself or the international community. So we will do all we can with our partners to dissuade Iran and find a possible path for dialogue and improvement of these conditions. France's role is not to encourage any one-upmanship. From the beginning, it's been to try and build an efficient, safe and useful response that reduces any nuclear risk and limits tensions in a region where we have many allies. So all in all, this is going to be a very difficult position for the Europeans. They are desperately trying to keep Iran within this deal. But if they do breach that limit on the, the uranium enrichment, it will be very difficult for them to stand by the deal as well. And then they might have to go along with the US event in the end and exit the deal. We'll have to wait and see, Isabel. OK, well, are you treading a very difficult park, path there, Jack Parrick? Thanks so much for joining us there from Brussels. Well, we're joined now by Ali Vyas. Now, he's the director of the International Crisis Group's Iran Project, and he consulted closely with all sides in Iran's nuclear nations, and he's in Washington. Well, thanks so much for joining us on the programme. Uh, just tell us, how concerned should we be about Iran's breaching of this nuclear deal? Very concerned. I think the Iranians are now making good on the threats that uh, they had put out out there in order to compel the remaining parties to the deal to try to throw it an economic lifeline. And now they're reaching a stage that they basically also for domestic political reasons see no choice other than uh, retaliating uh, on their side, uh, be it in the nuclear realm or in the region. And, and what about in terms of military conflict? Because we've seen tension rising between the US and Iran, most lately because of those attacks uh, on oil tankers in the Gulf. So uh, are we getting closer to military conflict between the US and Iran, in your opinion? Unfortunately, I think the answer to that question is yes, because although the escalation that we've seen so far in and of itself doesn't really... Uh, provide the cost of uh, and justification for a military strike on Iran. Uh, but each cycle of escalation brings us closer to the brink. And the reality is that the Trump administration's maximum pressure policy uh, has cornered the Iranians, dro drove their economy to the ground and pushed them now uh, to start pushing back and lashing out uh, in a situation where you have so much friction and so much tension between the parties and no channel of communication. The risks of miscalculation are extremely high. OK, that seems like a very dire situation you're kind of uh, elaborating on there. Um, but what are, what other options? Because uh, you mentioned that Iran is pushed into a corner now. But what other options could it potentially have? Well, at this stage, I, I see only two ways out of uh, the current predicament. One is that the remaining parties to the deal, the Europeans, uh, China and Russia, try to come together and find a way of... Uh, uh, buying Iranian oil or providing Iran with some kind of economic incentive that makes sense. And I think for in the case of the Europeans, they have already established a, a financial channel. And if they inject export credit into it, it could become operational pretty quickly. Uh, and in the case of China, it's purchase of Iranian oil. But there's also a way for the Trump administration. I think if uh, the president steps aside from his maximalist demands and uh, decides that he's going to provide Iran with sanctions relief in return for maybe a confidence building step on the Iranian side, we can definitely step uh, aside from this uh, collision course. OK, so poten potential there to step back from the brink. Well, thanks so much, Ali Vyas, the uh, director of the International Crisis Group's Iran Project. And as concerns continue to grow around Iran's nuclear program, a new report has found that the global risk of nuclear conflict is on the rise, even though the world's nuclear stockpiles have decreased slightly in the last 12 months. Well, let's break down the situation globally. And if we look at France and here we are, Russia, I mean, and the US. Now, Russia and the US hold about 90% of the world's nuclear stockpiles. And Russia there has 6,500 nuclear warheads. The US a little less at 6,185. And if we look at the situation around the world, there are seven other governments that are believed to hold nuclear warheads from France and China with about 
300 nuclear warheads there. The UK, 200. Rivals, Pakistan and India, with 160 and 140, respectively. Now, Israel has a very secretive nuclear program. It's believed to have 90 nuclear weapons. And if we look at the situation in Korea, it's believed to have 30 weapons. Now, Dan Smith joins us with more on this. Now, he's the director of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, which has published this report on the world's nuclear arsenal. And I asked him how severe the risk of a nuclear conflict has become. I think that it's not probable, but the possibility has probably risen in the last couple of years. I think there's been a serious deterioration of the geopolitical relationships between uh, the US and Russia and between the US and China. And I think that does make things more dangerous. But I think we're a long way short of thinking that a nuclear conflagration is actually probable. And the tactics of nuclear warfare appear to have changed. Uh, in, in what respect? Yes, that's right. It's a worrying development that it's especially clear with the US because they are more transparent, but there are reasons to think that the same is true of Russia as well, that they are attracted by the idea or by strategic doctrines that emphasize being able to use nuclear weapons and thus also being able to use them to advantage and thus potentially win a nuclear war. The other nuclear weapon owning states seem to have um, doctrines of minimal deterrence, which basically means that nuclear weapons would only be used as an absolute last resort if absolutely everything else had failed and probably everything had been destroyed anyway. But the, the Russians and Americans are getting close, as happened during the Cold War as well, especially in the 1970s, 1980s, to thinking that maybe nuclear weapons can be usable in the way that conventional weapons are. Uh, so, listening to you now, it does seem that we are stepping closer towards that nuclear brink, and it is really leadership-based. So, will, we, will the world almost require a change of leadership to step away from that? Well, I think the odd thing about the world at the moment is that the, amongst the great powers, there isn't one that favours the status quo and wants to look after the multilateral institutions. All three, Russia, China and the US, are all in different ways and for different reasons challenging uh, the uh, international political order and want it to be reshaped more in their benefit as they see it. So in those circumstances, I think what's extraordinarily important there is that the medium and the lesser powers get together more in order to be able to strengthen the multilateral institutions like the UN, but also the European Union, and also trust and confidence in, in treaties so that when they're signed, they will actually be uh, adhered to and, and implemented and kept to. And I think that if you, we get that sort of that push for the multilateral institutions, then what we'll begin to see is that it's not simply a question of leadership that can keep us safe. It's also the institutional arrangements which exist. But more of the medium and lesser powers have got to stand up and be counted in defense of the multilateral system, because that is what peace and cooperation are going to depend on in the coming uh, several years.